right. Um, welcome everyone. Um, so glad to, to host our third webinar of our 2022 webinar series. I um, just want to give a thanks to the Wild Sheep Foundation. Um, it was through their chapters and affiliates event that they hosted in Lewiston, Idaho in June um, that I was able to meet Dr. Christensen um, and invite her to present her wonderful work um, to us this evening. Um, thank you again, uh, Lauren, for joining us. Um, Dr. Christensen earned her DMV from Kansas State University in 2017. She is currently practicing large animal veterinary medicine in Lewiston, Idaho. Education and outreach programs in the ag community led her to her work with the Austin County Conservation District on the Bighorn Sheep Health Outreach Program since 2019. Since then, she has had the opportunity to collaborate with the Hell's Canyon Initiative on disease transmission between livestock and bighorn sheep. And she's currently finishing a master's degree at the University of Idaho researching antibiotic treatment options for MOV in domestic sheep. So wow, um, she's a busy lady uh, and we appreciate her taking the time out to join us this evening. Um, in her spare time, she enjoys fishing on the Clearwater River and spending time in the mountains with her boyfriend, Matt, um, and two dogs. Um, so Lauren, I'll pass it over to you to take it away. Um, thank you once again for being here. Thank you, Sarah, and, and thank you guys. Um, thanks everyone for making some time to, to tune in tonight. Um, I hope it's interesting. Um, definitely wanna be uh, answering questions brainstorming with everybody, regardless of your background or interest um, that's on this call. So um, if you have questions, um, uh, raise your hand, make a note in the chat. Um, I think we're gonna generally um, gear towards doing most of the questions towards the, the end um, of the presentation. But again, thank you for, for being here and, and making time. So. Um, uh, so my name is Lauren Christensen. I am a uh, large animal veterinarian and I got involved in this program a couple of years ago because of the vast majority of my clients in the Lewiston, Idaho region are um, small ruminant clients. Uh, I have a, a background in, uh, a, I did 4-H as a kid for years, so my background is actually in um, working with goats. I, I did run goats for um, commercial vegetation management for a number of years in California. Um, ended up out here in um, Idaho, and we're in a, an interesting area where we see a lot of overlap and potential for interaction between bighorn sheep and domestics. So, um, that definitely became an area of interest to mine, and it's kind of snowballed from there. So um, lucky to have been invited to, to work with the Soap County Conservation District um, and our other uh, constituents on this program. Um, I'm also joined tonight by um, Brooke Chase. She's our program assistant. Um, she's down here on the call somewhere. Hi, Brooke. Um, so a big thank you to her for her help with um, getting some data together for this, this presentation. Um, and she can also uh, help fend questions and, and other things at the end. So. So again, quickly brief background. We kind of all know that pneumonia is an ongoing um, issue for uh, bighorn sheep, but anyone that um, is new to this kind of situation, um, pneumonia has been identified as the major issue in recovering bighorn sheep populations to their historic levels um, and really being able to continue to have bighorn sheep populations in a sustainable um, amount um, long-term in, in the Western US. Uh, we have learned a lot. We, we've identified that pneumonia is kind of our un underlying problem, but we haven't looked uh, or really had the technology available to look deeper into um, root causes in pneumonia um, up until recently. So in the last about 10 or 15 years, we were able to actually get a lot more of um, scientific technology. So what we're able to do in the lab um, and kind of tease apart the, the reasons for pneumonia in bighorn sheep. Um, so kind of a quick schematic, we've got uh, a couple different herds here in the Hell's Canyon region. So I'm down here in um, the panhandle of Idaho, but also right here on that, I, I used to live in Washington. So it's that kind of tri-state area that I'm referring to in, in this region, um, Southeast Washington, the Idaho panhandle, Snake River corridor, a little bit of the Salmon River, and then of course, Northeastern um, Oregon. Um, and all of those herds kind of mix together. And so if we have an ammonia outbreak in one area, it's going to get transmitted to different herds just by virtue of those sheep kind of moving around. Um, again, with our technology updates, we knew that we had a pneumonia problem, but in the last 10 years or so, we have been able to do something called a polymerase chain reaction or PCR. And that is a test in the lab that is looking for 
the DNA of the mycoplasma over pneumonia bacteria. And we're able to actually tease out and isolate that as the primary pathogen causing um, pneumonia in bighorn sheep. So where does it come from, right? Um, Mycoplasma of pneumonia is a respiratory bacteria. It was first described in the 70s um, in, in New Zealand, um, but it's been uh, you know, seen worldwide. It's really quite ubiquitous. So it, I mean, it's present in sheep and goat populations across the globe. Um, anyone who has experience with uh, domestic sheep or goats, particularly I feel like goats, but I might be a little biased, um, people will often talk about having young animals that have kind of a chronic dry hacking cough. Um, and so that can certainly be uh, one of the signs that we see associated with mycoplasma of pneumonia in domestics. Um, a lot of these animals will have low-grade respiratory disease, so a cough, they might have a snotty nose. We see animals that tend to be, um, on, again, on the domestic side, um, they're usually infected by um, an, an older animal in the herd that has mycoplasma of pneumonia. Those kids or lambs are born, um, it is transmitted nose to nose. And so we'll have an older animal that smells those babies on the ground. Um, those kids or lambs will over time develop kind of a, a low key pneumonia or respiratory disease. We do occasionally see severe cases where they get incredibly sick, but most of them have that chronic low grade cough. They get older. By the time they hit about a year of age, most of these animals, their immune system is able to clear this infection. Those that don't clear the infection, we would call carrier animals. And those are often those animals that, again, become adults in the subsequent spring end up infecting um, lambs and kids that are born that following year. But nine times out of 10, these animals don't have any severe signs. Um, we do have some new data that's come out that shows a lot more of the, the bacteria family tree. Um, and so we're able to actually see that we, that, that mycoplasma of pneumonia is an old world bacteria. And so that actually evolved with domestic sheep and goats in Europe, if you think about how we colonized the Americas. Um, so that bacteria was in sheep and goats that came over to um, the Americas, you know, back when Columbus came over and, and actually settled Europeans moved over um, to, to the Americas. Um, so the thought is that these animals are, they, they have evolved and over time they've, they have some level of natural immunity to the mycoplasma of pneumonia, but this bacteria is able to jump species. We do actually see it in some other species. Um, and unfortunately in bighorn sheep, it's really quite severe and in causing disease. So on the domestic sheep side, we're kind of torn. There's a couple different studies that have been done looking at um, what the effects are of mycoplasma of pneumonia in domestic species. Because if it doesn't really have symptoms, I mean, why do we care, right? Um, why does the sheep industry care? Why does the person with pet goats in their backyard care? Um, we do have data that support that animals that are from a mycoplasma of pneumonia free herd or a negative herd, if you compare um, growth rates, weaning weights, et cetera, um, in commercial lambs to a positive herd, um, there is actually a difference in um, overall health scores, um, weaning weights, increased performance by um, having better uh, average daily gains in, in those lambs. Um, but again, not drastic death losses most of the time in domestic sheep flocks. So the other thing that we kind of awkwardly encounter is that there's no antibiotic to treat it and there's no vaccine to prevent it. WSU did a um, study, I think in 2014, looking at developing a vaccine. And this particular type of bacteria is really tough because it's, it's difficult to make a vaccine for it, regardless of the species. There's a similar vaccine, sorry, there's a similar bacteria in, in domestic pigs, um, and there is a vaccine for it in pigs, and it doesn't quite really work great. Um, the vaccine that was developed in um, the experiment in 2014 by WSU worked okay, but not really. A um, lot of side effects did not maintain um, efficacy for a very long time frame. Um, the animals needed a very large volume of material injected into them. So the vaccine that was developed at the time wasn't very effective. And currently there's no antibiotics to treat this either. So what are we gonna do? I mean, if we have positive animals and we have the potential for disease risk and transmission, 
what, what's the next step? Um, so that's kind of where um, this project came to be. Um, the idea was proposed to try and reduce the risk to bighorn sheep by promoting public awareness of this disease and working with people from all different backgrounds, interests, um, you know, different goals, and try and come up with a way to reduce the risk to bighorn sheep. So our program specifically, like I said, is, is targeting areas um, in the Hell's Canyon region. So I'm based out of um, the Lewis Clark Valley. Um, so our, our office for the Southern County Conservation District is in Clarkston, Washington. Um, we cover this whole tri-state region. Um, so I've been all the way down to Riggins, Idaho. I've been down to um, Enterprise in Joseph, Oregon. We've covered most of Southeast Washington. Um, I'm really focusing along um, potential areas for uh, animals to encounter domestics. So if we have any wildlife that is, is traveling, um, we're looking at trying to make sure that we're talking with folks on the edge of town um, and really anybody who potentially has animals in, in this region. So the primary focus is going to be our education and outreach, but then we do also offer a testing program. Um, so again, the education and outreach, the idea is that we're tackling this from the source. So again, this webinar that we're having today, thank you guys for being here. Um, whether or not people want to participate in the testing program, we want to make sure that people that um, are in the agricultural community, so whether that is 4-H advisors, um, extension agents, local veterinarians, my coworkers did not know that this was a, a disease of concern or, or a risk in this particular area um, until I started working on this program. Um, it, I'm really quite surprised by how many folks don't know or haven't heard about this as a potential risk. Um, and then, of course, we're actually directly contacting landowners in, in this region. So, um, again, folks that are primarily in areas of high risk for contact, and then also folks that Maybe they live in town, but they are, for example, a goat breeder, and they sell a number of goat kids to different 4-H members in the area, and then those 4-H kids take those goats home, and it just keeps on kind of spreading out from that particular location. Um, so everybody knows everybody. That's been kind of an, an interesting part of this, um, being able to talk to different people, and, and again, not only have people here from our program, but hear from their 4-H leader or hear from um, you know, their veterinarian, someone else that they regard as a mentor or um, you know, a person in the community that they trust. Being able to get that kind of um, knowledge passed around is, is really important. Um, it's also important on, in the case where we have people that um, do have animals in areas and they are not interested in participating in the program, maybe they at least you know, are keeping that in the back of their mind that, hey, you know, uh, if I see a big corn sheep in my area, I should, you know, maybe take some of these different steps. So we work directly with landowners to discuss the risks and then also um, talk about different approaches and try and solve different problems as, as they come up. So the people that we're interacting with are all over the board, um, whether it's landowners that don't actually own any animals, but they have weed control problems and they are looking to bring in animals for commercial grazing and vegetation control. Um, whether people just move to an area and they have animals as pets, um, whether people are, you know, making a livelihood off of these animals and, you know, that has a really significant economic cost. Um, what, what steps can they take and what steps can we take to help them out? That's what we've really been looking at. With testing, um, big picture, we, again, are working with flock and herd owners to talk about the disease, make sure they're educated. Um, but then we're also doing some disease and biosecurity um, strategies. So the testing program is free, it's voluntary, it's confidential. Um, the idea is that we are offering free mycoplasma or pneumonia um, nasal swab tests for folks that have domestic sheep and goats in this area. Um, and then if we have positive animals, we're talking about ways that they can reduce the risk to bighorn sheep in their area. Um, I'm on board with this program primarily to give guidance for these case-by-case -case scenarios um, and kind of work through these si different situations. Um, and and ag again, it really it depends. There, there's so many if-then-what type things that are, are going through our minds when we're, we're doing this. Um, again, taking into consideration, is this a beloved family pet or is this something that these people you know, are actually 
earning income from. Um, so a couple different pictures of kind of what we're doing. So usually we, we talk with folks um, in the area and make contact with landowners. Um, and then after we go through and do a uh, herd health screening, um, so we're doing these nasal swabs as we can see up in the, the um, top right corner here. Um, we send those off for testing at WSU, so that's Washington Animal um, Disease Diagnostic Laboratory. We get test results back and we talk with the owners and kind of see where we want to go. And so most of the time, if it's a new herd, um, we do two tests. We do a test on you know, whichever our first initial day is going to be, and then we retest in about four to six weeks. And I always tell people to not get too whipped up about the first test because um, we will often see animals change in status over that time frame. Um, so we're looking for animals that are positive both go arounds, and usually animals that are going to be older animals. If they're positive both times, we would call them as carrier animals, um, and then work, work with that landowner um, to kind of decide what they're going to do um, as far as having those animals um, or any further testing. Um, very interesting when you test young animals to see what they do over time, because we will see animals that clear this infection naturally, which is really interesting. Um, and then also talking with people about, okay, what, what do we want to do if you guys are, um, you know, looking at getting new animals, maybe they're all negative, which is excellent. Um, but if, again, they're usually in 4-H or doing something else, what are some steps that they can actually do to, um, take to reduce risk to their herd, um, and maintain a, a clean and, and negative herd over time? Um, other perks of just kind of going through, we do have a, a number of folks that, um, are going to be handling their animals for other purposes. So a lot of times we do help them kind of move animals through their facilities. So in this case, um, since we were handling the animals anyway to do these um, health screenings on them, we helped this gentleman um, deworm all of his animals. So they were due for their annual um, uh, external parasite uh, prevention. So we we're helping with that. Um, and then we've also gotten really, really good feedback from a bunch of different folks um, again, just talking locally in a couple different social media networks. So this one particular gal, um, she was a huge asset to the program um, and, and she's been great to work with over the, the, the last two years. Um, but just from her reaching out to the people that she knew, um, I think we ended up with an additional four or five contacts in that region. Um, she was incredibly appreciative that we could come out and do a herd screening. Um, and fortunately, her animals were negative. Um, and so she was excited to know that they were negative um, and kind of keep that in consideration as far as where she was selling animals. Um, she sold goats as pets. Um, she was a lot more comfortable um, selling them regardless of where people were actually going to be living with those, those particular animals. Uh, another aspect that we've tried to, to get, do to get the word out, um, we worked with a local um, uh, landowner who actually was one of the original folks that participated in this program um, when we launched this a couple of years back. He originally had animals for vegetation control, um, was super excited to be participating in the program, very much conscientious about his potential impact with our local wildlife population. Um, and he worked with us to get a, his herd free of Movi. Um, he actually was able to go through, we did a series of tests um, and basically screened and separated all the, the positive animals. Um, and he has worked to have a, a productive herd that is negative. Um, and we're just doing kind of annual screenings at, at this point in time. So he's been a great resource. Um, he's you know, very well thought of in the community and that's been great for us. Um, he's a great advocate for the program. Um, and for you know folks participating in, in this testing program. Um, so he was willing to, to have his animals interviewed and some pictures done and we got this out in our local newspaper and, and were able to get some more interest generated that way. Um, but again, even if you don't have sheep and goats, the people that are reading this particular um, you know, uh, article are still able to keep that in the back of their mind and they probably know somebody who has goats or they know somebody who you know their, their kids are in 4-H and they get fair lamps every year so having this discussion in the community um has that trickle down effect and, and does spread over over time another one that we've tried to do is is really target 4-H and FFA events um, we've had some difficulty having 
in-person stuff with uh, the number of COVID restrictions over the last two years. Our, our goal has been to really talk with a lot of these folks at fairs um, or to have open house town hall type meetings. Um, we were able to have one of those back in 2019, um, but this year is the first year that we're really able to start ramping back up and, and actually meeting with people at fair and super excited to be able to have a booth um, at one of our major fairs here um, in the next couple of months. So this is kind of an, an infographic um, poster that we had, and I know it's a little bit small on your guys' screen, but this is something that we put together for um, the Nez Perce County Fair, which is in um, Lewiston, um, back in this uh, fall of 2021. So I think that was in September. Um, this was in their sheep and goat barn. So just, again, getting, making it easy for people to kind of process what's going on and have a visual representation of, of how the disease is transmitted. Um, and then also uh, we, we do have some more uh, specific maps, but something for them to reference to say, oh, maybe I do live in a risk area, even if I am kind of, you know, not in Hell's Canyon. Um, having all of this information just available for everybody was, was really good. I did notice a number of people walking up to um, the the poster and like taking pictures with their phone of the contact information, which was great. Um, talk to the number of the 4-H leaders at that particular um, fair and continue the conversation. Um, we have, I think, five or six people that are associated with the 4-H program in, in that county that um, have been part of the program and they've been excellent to work with. And again, over time, it's just that kind of trickle down effect that, that really helps out. Um, our next stop is going to be the Soton County Fair coming up uh, next month, so at the end of April, and kind of going from there. So again, we've been doing this for a couple of years now, and it's really interesting to see what we've learned. So when I was initially approached about helping out with the project, the goal was to discuss this with um, sheep producers, commercial sheep producers with uh, grazing allotments in kind of you know, forest service type areas. And we just don't really have folks that do that in anymore in our region. I know we do in other parts of Idaho, um, but up here we don't have a whole lot of folks that are running commercial um, sheep flocks. Um, again, we, we do have that also in, in central Washington. Um, we've had a lot more goats than we anticipated. I, I knew that we had quite a few goats in the region, but I didn't realize we had this many goats. Um, so we're looking at, um, over the last three years, a, a total of almost a thousand animals, um, individual animals that we have tested, um, varying in size from people having one pet goat in their yard to having, um, I think we've done a couple herds with uh, 60 plus head of, of domestic goats. And we've also tested herds with um, about 400 sheep. Um, so they were actually not range sheep, they were sheep being, um, raised for uh, trophy hunting, if I remember correctly. Um, they were hair sheep. But looking at this, we're, we're coming up with about 13% of individual goats being positive, um, and then about 34% of herds. So if you randomly pick three herds that we went to, uh, one out of three will have at least one positive animal in them. Um, and again, most of these animals have no clinical symptoms whatsoever. Um, they're happy, they're healthy. Um, as a veterinarian, I would not hesitate to write a health certificate for them to travel. Um, this is not a regulatory disease, so it's not something that is required to be reported um, to the state veterinarian. It's not required to be tested for. A lot of folks that do have sheep and goats are doing some other um, disease screenings before adding animals to their herds, and this is often not on their radar. Um, so again, just getting that, that word out there and, and talking about different things. <laughs> um, the majority of people that are in this particular program keep about one to five goats as pets. Um, we have, I want to say, a little over 150 to 160 folks that we have contacted over the course of this time frame. The vast majority um, are pet goat owners. A lot of them have moved from some more urban areas. Um, this is their first time owning livestock. They have no um, you know, historical knowledge of any kind of ongoing issues with um, pneumonia in bighorn sheep. They have no knowledge of any kind of um, commercial uh, sheep restrictions on, on grazing. Um, 
they, they truly just have pet animals who have never heard of this before. Um, the other factor on this that we have to keep in mind then is that most people want to know whether the animals are negative or positive, but at the same time, if they have positive animals, they want to keep those animals because again, they're either pets you know, they have sentimental value, or I have a, a handful of folks that have participated in the program and the animals that they have are of high genetic value for breeding purposes. Um, so those animals are, are worth treating or, or doing something. And regardless of if I brought the topic up or not, everyone asks, can I treat this? Can I fix this? What medication can I give to it? What kind of vaccines can I give to my animals? Um, and we don't have that right now. Um, so there is definite interest in, in having some way to fix this on the domestic side. Um, we're just slowly kind of working towards that um, and being able to provide folks with an answer. In the meantime, um, again, increasing awareness and then going through on a case-by-case -case situation, working through risk management and mitigating risk is, is gonna be our best bet in talking about biosecurity. So long-term, again, our goal is to continue go, uh, offering testing. Um, I have probably about 30% of the people that have enrolled in the program have been really gung-ho, supportive of the program long-term. They're excited to have us out for their annual um, testing. Um, along with that, I, I have a handful of folks that are running um, you know, large groups of, of goats or herd or, or sheep and they are interested in testing and removing positive animals. And that's really, really exciting. Um, we have a lot of interest in that from the 4-H sheep community, um, as well as a, a gal who um, experienced a pneumonia outbreak in her goat kids uh, a number of years ago. We don't know, because she was not enrolled in the program at that point in time, but we would guess that based on the history, it was probably related to mycoplasma over pneumonia. And she has been great about um, working with us to, to do some screening. And um, the, her goal long-term is to, to remove all of the, the Moby positive animals from her herd, which is awesome. Um, we have two other producers or, or owners that live in very, very high-risk areas. Um, you know, within a couple hundred yards of where animal uh, collared bighorn sheep have been known to be. So we know that those are risk areas. Um, they have negative animals. They have been excellent to work with. They are super excited about the program. They live there because they love to see wildlife. They had no knowledge that this was a potential risk um, prior to bringing animals into that area when they, they moved there. Um, and again, fortunately, they're negative. They've been excellent to work with and they're proactive. So, um, you know, if they are at all considering getting new animals, we have offered to test them and have tested new animals off site prior to those animals traveling onto the property. Um, one gal has actually decided to go um, the AI route. So, in order to increase her biosecurity, her kids don't take the goats to fair. If they do, the goats leave the property um, and it's a market goat and it gets sold at fair and it never comes home. So they're never bringing anything back home. Um, and they are uh, working on getting artificial insemination set up so that they are not transporting animals to be bred to an outside buck. They're not bringing a buck onto the property. Um, they just know that their herd is, is clean and it's closed and they don't have any disease issues. So um, that seems to be working really well for them. Um, really excited that we're able to offer that and, and work through that particular case with them. Um, Again, with some of the COVID restrictions uh, kind of letting up, we're excited to be able to start doing stuff in person. Um, so we've got a couple different fairs, uh, you know, scheduled for the next six months to go and talk. Um, and again, we've got some webinars. So thank you for, for inviting us to talk here today, um, as well as developing some additional resources for, um, you know, domestic sheep and goat owners. We, we just overhauled the Soton County Conservation District website. Um, we have a video that shows uh, owners how to conduct the swab um, in the case that they're out of our kind of region. Um, that's It's a good resource for them to be able to actually take the swab correctly um, because there is a little bit of a technique to it. Um, and that's also something that can be shared with their veterinarian if they're, again, too far out of our, our area to be working with them. Um, and then working on putting together some maps for folks to, to kind of understand exactly where they could potentially have a, a problem encountering big horn sheep. So. That's what I've got for you guys. I am more than happy to answer any kind of questions and thoughts that you have. I know that was a lot of information. Um, so I guess, Sarah, if you want to 
if you have any specific questions, um, if you want to start there, and then we can just kind of take it away. Thank you for such an excellent presentation. Um, I received four questions in advance. Um, okay. Go through these, if that works with you, and then we can sure. take, um, some from the from the crowd this evening. Um, so, first question um, is: uh, Thank you for building bridges with the ad community. Um, while your work seems quite successful with smaller producers. Um, on smaller acreages, do you have any thoughts about how your work may be applied to larger producers, let's say two to 10,000 domestic sheep utilizing public lands, grazing allotments, covering thousands of acres? That, that's a great question and that's a tough one. Um, you know, uh, so in herds that are over about I think 40 animals we in in my experience in the the herds that we have tested through this program once we crack about 40 head of animals um we have at least one positive in that group um so we are going to just assume that a herd of you know 10,000 head has positive animals in, in that group so there's a couple different strategies that we can kind of go through um you know if we're having animals that are being grazed in an area whether it's um you know sheep or goats the highest risk animals are going to be those young stocks so animals that um are under a year of age are going to be significantly more likely to be having movi um and, and shedding it um at any point in time um as they get older it, it does seem that we have a significant decrease in the likelihood of animals being positive so in a management standpoint, if there's any way to select for older animals that um, have not been in contact with younger animals in that herd, if there is an option to run those animals in maybe two different groups, um, again, it really depends on, on management. Um, having an, an older group of, of animals would be ideal. Um, again, going back to our um, participant who had the goats for vegetation control, it is possible to get to a negative herd, um, at least in goats, and, and granted he's running a little over 100 head, um, but it's a challenge, and I think that's something that we need, really need to be aware of. Um, and, and the other aspect to look at, too, is trying to just reduce risk in general. So um, for those that we have worked with where they have positive animals, and they are unable to um or unable or unwilling to um you know relocate those animals making sure that the animals are securely um fenced is is huge um having a double fence if at all possible is is going to make a big difference and so even if animals are on range if we can put you know portable electric net fencing up and then put an additional layer of that net fencing up um trying to physically separate animals um, is gonna make a difference. And then of course, having livestock guardian dogs. So livestock guardian dogs are, are a great deterrent. Um, I've, I've, we have a couple people that have positive goats that are housed in a smaller pen, maybe near their barn, um, which is near the house on their property, but they have a whole perimeter fence around the entire property. Again, this is more of the, the smaller um, acreage type setups. Um, and then they usually have a dog that just hangs out in the yard and it chases off anything that comes around. Granted, we can still have wildlife doing what they want to do, right? But um, that seems to really be a, a major deterrent and that, that helps with keeping things separate as, as best as possible. Sorry, that was a little long-winded. So hopefully they answered some other questions too. Thank you. Uh, moving to the second question um, that we have. Does your bacterial bacterial pathogen testing drill down to the strain level? If so, what are you finding? That is a great question. So what we are doing is a deep nasal swab and we are doing, we're submitting these for um, PCR analysis at WSU. We have the ability to do strain typing, but that is not within the scope of this program. Um, and so I, I can't, I don't have additional information about strain typing. Right now, most of the swabs um, are simply being looked at for the yes or no, um, is there a presence of mycoplasma DNA in this particular swab? And that's what we're looking at. So we don't have a lot of strain typing data. Mm -hmm. So strain typing, to get a little bit further into it, um, individual tests through WSU are, I believe, 
60 to $40 per head, and we are covering the costs of these tests um, as a courtesy to producers for enrolling in this program. Um, so being able to do a herd screening and remove animals or, or work on, uh, you know, calling animals that are positive and, and working towards negative herds um, is huge in, in those, you know, handful of producers where we're able to do that. Um, definitely money well spent in cases where we're able to verify the animals are negative. Um, but strain typing is significantly more expensive than that. I, I do not remember offhand, but it's a couple hundred dollars per sample. Thank you. Um, before we get ahead of ourselves uh, with other questions we received in advance, let's just go to the chat. Um, okay. So uh, Dr. Perry Wolf asked how many herds were tested. Um, Brooke responded that 76 domestic herds have been tested and a handful of herds, both sheep um, I mean, goats. Many herds have tested two, three times through annual testing. Um, second question on the chat came from Helen Swancha. Um, she asks, have you seen any breed susceptibility or higher prevalence? Um, does everyone tested get an annual test? And are you testing for anything other than MOV? And Brooke, re <clears throat> Brooke responded, uh, the majority of the data is of goats. There have not been any specific tests conducted looking at the correlation of specific breeds. We have found that in domestic animals, it affects kids the most, regardless of being a sheep or goat. Um, Christian uh, Broner asks, in the bighorn population, is there any evidence of resistance being acquired? Since the domestic breeds seem to be less susceptible, is there any antibodies, if so, being passed from the uh, dam to offspring via colostrum? Okay, so that's a good question. and I'll, I'll talk about the, the second part of that question first. So, Again, our, our typical disease transmission within a herd, let's say someone has a herd of 30 goats, um, they probably have a, an adult animal that's a carrier, so it's positive. They have a bunch of does that are bred in the fall and they're, they, they kid about now, so in March. Um, and when those kids hit the ground, um, those kids are exposed to, to Movi by contact with a, a carrier animal. Um, so the adults that are not carriers that are living with this um, carrier animal have been exposed to that animal. Um, they generally have developed antibodies, um, which we can potentially see some decrease in antibodies and ability to fight this infection off um, due to stress-related events is, is our best hypothesis. Um, but if you were to test kids that were born, even if they had nose to nose contact with a, a carrier animal and you tested them, um, you know, a couple days later, you may not necessarily get a positive on those kids because yes, there is some colostral antibodies generally being transmitted by the mother. Um, most of the time um, we're seeing the waning of the colostral antibodies and the infection happening at about two months of age. And that's generally our cutoff. So if I'm testing a herd of animals, um, I'm usually testing kids and lambs once they hit about eight weeks of age, um, partly to be consistent with this. And then um, uh, also, frankly, partly because it's incredibly difficult to physically get a swab down the nostril of a very tiny brand new baby kid. Um, so eight weeks has been our, our cutoff thus far. Um, and that seems to be the most appropriate way to, to get data from them that's, that's correct. Um, the other part of the question was, oh, Sarah, remind me, I'm, I'm sorry. Since the domestic breeds seem to be less susceptible, is okay. there any bodies? Yeah. Sure, sure. Um, so there are two tests for mycoplasma ovum pneumoniae. One is a nasal swab where we're doing PCR. You can also do PCR on, on lung tissues of deceased animals. And then the other way to screen for Movi, and this is a screen and not like a true test for presence, um, would be a blood test. So you can take blood samples from domestics or from bighorn sheep and look for antibodies, which would indicate that the animal has been exposed and has developed antibodies um, if they have gone through an infection. It does not tell you on the blood test um, whether the animal currently is infected um, or anything about kind of a, a time frame, how much bacteria is present, anything like that. It just tells you whether or not they have antibodies. Um, we are seeing that, the, the presence of antibodies in bighorn sheep. Um, 
my understanding, and I, I, this is not my primary area of interest or, or, or research, but my understanding is that um, antibody levels at this point in time are not necessarily correlated with immunity in bighorn sheep, if, if that makes sense. We don't know what a cutoff would be for the amount of antibodies for them to be protective. Someone else has done that research and I, that, that's my best understanding at this point. Thank you. Um, again, from Dr. Perry Wolf. It yes. was interesting to know if mixed flocks have goat and sheep strains or just sheep strains. And yes, hi Perry. Um, you that that brings up a great point. So we we have um, data on. I, I think I hand, Brooke would know better uh, um, on the the numbers for this, but offhand, I think we've only had about five or six mixed flocks. Um, many of those uh, are situations where people have an entirely sheep flock and one like mascot goat or vice versa, they have all goats and one fair lamb or something like that. Um, so the distribution is really not great um, in those and the numbers that we have aren't, aren't great. Um, but yes, that would be very interesting to see kind of what is and isn't circulating in those, those particular situations. Yeah, just to comment on that, Lauren, um, I have the data pulled up that we great, did thanks. for this presentation. And it says that we had eight herds that had both animals. Five okay. herds had at least one positive out of those eight herds. Um, okay. And there were only three herds of those combined animals that only, uh, or that didn't have any positive animals. Okay. Um, and taking it back um, to the question we received in advance, what are the costs associated with testing and can one just test a sample of the domestic herd, especially, you mentioned the cost, but maybe we can elaborate, um, especially if a larger herd and feel comfortable. Sure, um, so again, as, as we discussed, um, it should producers or owners want to do testing on their own or in conjunction with their veterinarian. Um, we do have that video on the Soap County Conservation District website um, on how to properly obtain that nasal swab sample, um, package it, submit it for testing. And, and the lab that we're doing this with is, is Washington State University. Um, if you were to choose a subset, um, if, if you were looking at a, a commercial herd, I would definitely focus on young animals, um, ideally animals between about four to eight or 10 months of age um, seems to be the, the most likely time frame if you're just doing a, a screening. Um, so sometime, if those uh, animals were born in the spring, sometime during the summer, or early fall, um, go through and, and uh, sample a subset of them and, and see what you're finding. Excellent. Um, this is a question. You mentioned um, how this, how MOV is in a, is in a disease um, that needs to be tested for in order for you know goat to, to travel. From a policy perspective, do you see that possibly changing? Um, so uh, unfortunately, not really. So, so when we, we think of regulatory diseases, um, things that are required on a health certificate for animals to cross state lines or travel, um, things that animals are required to be vaccinated for, um, the policies are in place because either that disease affects humans or that disease is significant and severe and endangers the U.S.'s ability to um, engage in global trade or have a healthy, secure food supply. Um, so diseases that we're talking about would be like tuberculosis. Um, we test dairy cows for that. Um, equine infectious anemia or Coggins, the Coggins test, anyone that transports horses, that's usually required annually. Um, that is a foreign animal disease. And while it does pose a problem to people, um, that is something that we can't cure or treat in horses. And so obviously that's a huge issue if you can't cure it and it's generally fatal in horses. Um, so that's why that is, is a, a um, regulated disease. Unfortunately, mycoplasma ovulonia doesn't really fall into that category. Um, so it's not really of interest because we're not having any kind of trade losses, um, you know, in, in domestics. Um, doesn't affect people. And unfortunately, no, I don't really see that becoming a, a state legislated required thing um, from that perspective. Thank you. 
Um, we have a question. Steve Kilpatrick asked if Helen Schwancha could provide a summary of her work on MOV treatment and domestics. So I don't want to steal <laughs> Lauren's thunder, but uh, Lauren, I, I, we I haven't know. met before. No, um, but we're going to. Uh, I work um, in British Columbia. I was the former wildlife vet there and have um, retired as of a year ago, but I um, have a few things that I'm still doing and this is one of them. Um, we've Good. had um, a trial going on using enrofloxacin for uh, treating um, a couple of different sheep flocks to clear them um, mm -hmm. using primarily Tom Besser's protocol um, with a tweak or two. We're just writing that up now um, and following it up with a, another sampling in the next month or so. Um, be really, thanks a lot, Steve. I, I'd be really interested in sharing it with you, but it's a little preliminary. However, I can say that we really reduce the prevalence in Excellent. both flocks. One flock we have uh, in, in the fall, we had no further positives. Um, oh, wow. The flocks vary in, um, number density management however the the really similar thing is that they all sourced well they they both are um high quality wool breeds okay. and have been breeding for that and one in particular um sourced their animals from um, a breeder in the u.s and it's a very narrow gene pool put it that sure, way sure. okay um, the other really interesting management uh, difference between the two of them is that one, the one that is currently clear did not breed last year and doesn't plan to breed this year. And I think that's a really key uh, factor. So mm -hmm. just in a nutshell, we have been treating them. We have different uh, regulations in Canada so that we can use yes. it. Um, and uh, it does seem to make a difference. Um, both of these flocks had significant health challenges when that bacteria was introduced into their flocks. Um, we don't know their status beforehand, but it appears that it was a recent introduction into both flocks and they had mortalities both in adults and lambs, very similar to bighorn sheep. Absolutely. So, yeah. so, Helen, so I'd love to talk to you yeah. more about that. Oh, yes. Um, yeah, anyway. Yeah. Oh. Well, I'll make sure we get a hold of you. And um, uh, Helen, to kind of expand on that, I know that there's so much to cover, and I wanted to focus on this program. But for Absolutely. those of you that um, uh, in, are, are curious and interested, since we brought it up, um, that there's an antibiotic that Helen's discussing that um, has potential, um, and it's been showing some promise, um, definitely in, in Canada and the US. Um, but the problem with that particular antibiotic um, based on the U.S. Um, regulations, we are very limited in our ability to use it. Um, sheep are considered food producing animals um, and the amount of um, uh, regulation on what we can and can't use for antibiotics um, is very strict and stringent in the U.S. Um, again, this is very much in a nutshell, um, but basically we, we cannot use that antibiotic um, off-label or not according to label directions in the U.S. to treat mycoplasma open pneumonia. So while it does look like it works, um, we're looking at some different options that would fall underneath the regulatory umbrella, but we, they are options in, in the U.S. Um, another point that you brought up, which is really interesting, um, so again, I, I've talked a lot about um, Movi being an issue, usually in young stock under a year old, um, and I, I will comment that um, both in sheep and goats, um, in animals that we work with in this group, we I have had contacts where they have introduced new adult animals to their herd, and the adults within a couple of weeks of arriving will develop some respiratory signs, even if the adults came from a very short distance away. Um, so often in animals that are transported, we are worried about respiratory disease for various factors, um, mostly due to, to stress and, and shipping. Um, but it is interesting to me that those animals, if they're adults, often test positive in a herd where the original animals in that herd that are positive are going to be only young stock. So my hypothesis with that is that those adults that are new um, have not been exposed to that particular strain or they've not been exposed to mycoplasma open pneumonia before. Um, and so we're seeing respiratory signs in those new animals as well.
Thank you. Um, next question is from Charlie Kelly from Arizona, um, also on the uh, Wild Sheep Foundation board. Um, once you have identified positive animals in these herds, are they usually euthanized? If not, what has been the alternative to remove the risk? Sure, so, and that, that's a great question. Um, the majority of the animals that are identified positive so far, unfortunately, have been in either pet herds where they have sentimental value um, or they are breeding animals with high genetic value in those particular herds. Um, so again, that's the, then the drive from those owners. Can I treat this? Can I vaccinate for it? What can I do to fix it? Um, a lot of those owners are isolating those animals or taking additional steps to make sure that they um, cannot, you know, leave the property. They have additional fence barriers, something else like that. Um, the thing, the cases I'm thinking of are, are um, usually uh, buck goats, so intact male goats that are worth quite a, a like several thousand dollars um, and, and genetically valuable too. Um, we've had a couple of folks that were unaware that this was an issue. They saw goats online. They thought they were cool. They bought some goats from the sale yard. They have these two pet goats um, and they were willing to rehome them. Um, and so that's kind of an in progress. Um, where, where do we rehome these positive animals to where it's no longer a, a risk area? Um, so again, that's kind of an in progress uh, situation that we're currently dealing with. Um, I've had one or two people on the commercial side where they're looking at it from a business standpoint um, that have harvested the animals at home for home consumption because again, we're not um, worried about this as a human health risk um, and that seems to be an appropriate outlet for, for these animals. Um, and we've really discouraged people from selling animals at the local sale yard. Um, the idea is that we have these positive animals that are then just being recirculated willy-nilly into the, the community and we don't want them to just end up back in another risk area. Um, so we've taken some steps to try and give these people different alternatives and also facilitate them with either a um, you know, harvest option or somewhere else for those animals to go um, when we're able to get them to, to say, okay, I don't want to have this animal anymore. Thank you. Um, and Brooke added to the chat, for animals that test positive, we'd like to follow up with another test because many adults will clear it themselves. Um, she adds that other adult animals test positive multiple times, characterized as car carriers. Um, what happens to these animals is solely up to the landowner. Um, one other question from Christian um, Brunner. Are you, do you see a difference in morbidity prevalence in sheep or goats on pasture versus barns? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I don't think we have enough data for that at this point in time um, to really look at it, although it, it's been on my uh, ongoing to-do list is to, to look a little bit more at, at housing. And I don't know if we're going to see a bit of a correlation um, or I guess a, a um, cause and effect or just kind of a you know, random situation where things overlap. Um, we did see last spring quite an increase in um, positive animals, but we also tested a lot of animals that were between two and six months of age last spring. Um, that being said, those animals at that time frame were housed in barns most of the time. Um, so are they increased in, in, are we seeing an increase in positivity because they're kept in close quarters um, could we reduce that potentially if we were lambing maybe like out on the range, but nobody wants to lamb in March out on the snow, right? Um, so whether that, that actually is, um, you know, correlated or not, I, I'm not sure. Thank you. Um, with that, I think we've covered, oh, let's see, covered all the questions. Um, Lori Baton asks if you wouldn't mind sharing a PDF version of your outreach poster. Absolutely, yes. Um, I can actually, um, Sarah, would you like me to send that to you and you can distribute that or what would yeah. you guys like to do? That would work. Okay, okay, that will work. Um, oh, one more question from um, the okay. Butler. Gary Butler asks, how did the CD get involved in this program? He said he finds that interesting. Oh, sure. So, so this program, um, this was kind of a brainchild from the Health Canyon Initiative a couple of years back. Um, and so our, our stakeholders include um, Idaho Fish and Game, 
um, Washington Fish and Wildlife, Oregon um, Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, as well as our uh, the Wild Sheep Foundation, and then our, our local chapters, um, so Idaho, uh, Oregon, and, and Washington as well. Um, and the idea was that we wanted to have some kind of uh, organization um, that was not, um, you know, a, a regulatory or, or other kind of governmental. Mess I, regulatory is more the, the, the better um, term. Um, you know, someone that is familiar with working with landowners on different options. Um, so, so the County Conservation District does a ton of work um, on watershed restoration um, in our, our region, um, erosion control, uh, noxious weeds, et cetera. Um, so it was really easy for Asoa County to step in and kind of be the flagship for this particular um, program and kind of bundle everything underneath. Um, they had the infrastructure in place and, and get a lot of the landowner contacts. So um, it's worked out really, really well so far. Yeah. Um, yes, thank you. Um, we're seeing thanks come from the audience. Thank you so much. Um, Lauren and Brooke, it was wonderful to have you with us this evening. Um, I'm really excited to offer this recording um, on our website. So for those who couldn't make it this evening, please direct them to our website under programs. We have um, a part on our website that says re repository where we keep all of our webinars. Um, so feel free to um, share that with your friends. Um, I'd also like to add that if you joined our program tonight and you're not familiar with the National Bighorn Sheep Center, um, please email us at info at bighorn.org um, so that we can get you on our, our email and um, newsletter list. We, we distribute quarterly newsletters um, in the mail um, with, with great information. Um, with that, I will just say thank you. Um, and invite everyone to our next webinar. Um, this will take a turn from our typical a second Thursday of each month because we have the fortunate opportunity to have Dr. Francis Casier visit um, the National Bighorn Sheep Center on, in person. Um, and uh, to align with her travel schedule, she'll be with us on Saturday, April 9th. Um, and we hope to uh, broadcast that um, and have that recorded. She will be talking about test and, remove, test and remove as a management strategy. So um, once again, thank you, Dr. Christensen. It's been a pleasure. Um, and I look forward to seeing many of you um, April 9th and at our future webinars. Thank you, everybody. Have a good evening. <laughs>